so today I'm going to talk about uh, international migration. And uh, first of all, I will try to uh, connect uh, my talk to the, the general topic of uh, this talk, which is about inequality. And uh, something that I'm going to emphasize in my talk is that, of course, there, there has been a lot of uh, action uh, in terms of international mobility of people across uh, countries. Uh, and we know that uh, actually uh, global migration uh, is on the rise. So if you look at the, the raw numbers of people uh, leaving their country and uh, working or living in another country, uh, we see that uh, over time, for a period of uh, 50 years, in terms of uh, absolute numbers, this has uh, led to a big increase. Uh, it has been multiplied by more or less uh, uh, three times. But uh, the, the point that I would like to emphasize today, it's not so much about uh, the, the rise in international migration, but the fact that uh, this phenomenon is uh, subject to a lot of heterogeneity or inequality. And I'm going to emphasize that, uh, first of all, uh, this uh, heterogeneity in uh, the phenomenon of international mo mobility concerns many, many different dimensions. And then, I, and I apologize in advance that maybe for those who have been working on uh, international migration, I'm going to present a very quick picture of what uh, is the, the situation using actual data on migration flows. But the thing that my main point today is that I'm going to emphasize that we can make use of new type of data, which is about migration aspirations, to explain this heterogeneity. So, uh, so the, 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 there is a huge heterogeneity of uh, international mobility of people across the main ingredients of uh, the mobility uh, phenomenon. First of all, and this is well known, there, is a, a large, there are large differences uh, in terms of immigration rates. Conchita was talking about brain drain, uh, I've been working, it's how I started on this literature, I've been working on brain drain, and I can tell you that when you look at immigration rates of skilled people across origin countries, there is a huge heterogeneity. There are countries in which, I mean, skilled people, almost 80% of skilled people would like to leave their country, while in some developed countries, I mean, the, the phenomenon of brain drain is something which is very modest, okay? So this is something which is well known. You see, there are also large differences in terms of immigration rates. And let me show you a, a picture from a, a, a recent uh, report of the World Bank. So I would uh, advise you to uh, have access to, to this report and to look at uh, the uh, investigation in that report because it's very useful. But you see that, uh, actually, if we look at the destinations of these international migrants, Relatively speaking, international migrants tend to concentrate to a few destinations if we take all countries of the world. And basically, what uh, this uh, figure shows you is that the, the typical destinations that uh, international migrants tend to favor are destinations in Western Europe, North America, and of course, there is some recent action uh, of destinations belonging to uh, these uh, high-income MENA countries, so the Gulf countries, especially uh, people coming from uh, uh, the low-income countries uh, of MENA and going to, to these destinations. But apart from that, you see that you have a lot of uh, set of destinations that are not so much favored by uh, international migrants. So, this is a second dimension of heterogeneity in this global phenomenon of mobility. And then, if we look also at uh, a, a couple of, um, if we look at corridors, if we look, if we take into account, basically, the mobility, taking into account the origin and the destination of these immigrants, the heterogeneity is even higher. And just to illustrate that, so I have taken this uh, picture of um, also from the World Bank report that gives you the, the, the movement of people taking into account the origin, and these origins are uh, expressed in terms of set of countries, to 
the destination. And you see, and the, the, the size of uh, these uh, movements gives you an idea of how many people and the share of these people in the total phenomenon of uh, mobility uh, when you take into account the origin and the destination. So, for instance, here you see that there is still a lot of mobility within Europe, but there is a lot of people migrating from, for instance, uh, South America and Central America to the US. Okay? So, and to further emphasize that point about uh, heterogeneity, I have just here put uh, a very simple statistic. This is the number of corridors that are empty. What does it mean? It means the number of, uh, uh, the number of places, uh, maybe it's, it's, it's better to give an example. So how many uh, people uh, of Luxembourg live, uh, for instance, in Australia, okay? And so this is a proportion of these uh, bilateral uh, stock that uh, are zero. So it means that even nowadays, and it was even uh, larger before, even nowadays, about a little bit less than half of these corridors are empty. There are no people from a specific origin country living in the destination. So it's just to document a little bit this huge heterogeneity uh, that we see in the data capturing actual migration flows, okay? So one of the challenges of uh, the, the literature uh, on the determinants of uh, uh, migration flows has been to try to understand why we have such an heterogeneity and to try to pin down the determinants of these international migration flows. And of course, there is a huge literature on that that I'm not going to review. And I, once again, I apologize to give a, a, couple of, uh, um, a, a couple of points, useful points for those not following uh, uh, that type of literature. So the, there, are, there is a huge literature um, trying to identify the determinants of uh, these, uh, this heterogeneity in terms of uh, actual migration flows. So the usual suspect, of course, is the wage gap. Okay? And the wage gap, uh, has been highly documented in, uh, in many, many studies, including, once again, this uh, um, uh, World Bank report showing that, of course, the wage differential and the, the differential in economic opportunities for these international migrants is one of the main drivers, okay? And here, for instance, you see that if you connect the share of people moving uh, and you connect that with the, the, the differential in the expected wage between the destination and origin, you see that you have a very, very good prediction, okay? So the wage differential is obviously one of the main drivers of uh, these uh, international migration flows. We know that uh, there are additional factors like, for instance, cultural proximity, if you have uh, good proxies, if you have good indicators of this cultural proximity, like the fact that people share uh, a similar language or a common language. Uh, and it has been shown that, of course, cultural proximity is also an important driver. Distance between the countries and a very simple way of capturing the distance can be used uh, using uh, uh, this, uh, the, this figure. This gives you the share of uh, people uh, moving uh, to a destination with respect to the distance of that destination with respect the, uh, to, to their origin. So you see that you have, and it depends of, of course on the types of migrants that you are going to capture, but you see that distance is a main driver. So you have a high concentration of people moving to very close country. And, it's, it, and it is of course the case uh, for instance, for refugees, but it is the case for unskilled people. It is less the case for skilled people. So skilled people uh, are less subject to this issue of distance. But you see that, of course, um, uh, of course, uh, there are almost no uh, there are almost no migrants uh, migrating uh, to very very large destinations, especially if they are uh, unskilled. Everything is, of course, relative, but of course, this uh, issue of distance is, uh, is important. 
Of course, uh, there are other factors that, uh, that I'm not going to emphasize too much because I want to uh, emphasize the main uh, point of my talk today. But you have also, as uh, Conchita said, uh, there has been a lot of uh, uh, evidence that networks or diasporas act as attracting devices. Uh, there has been a huge literature on push and pull factors, so factors that are specific at the origin and factors that are specific at the destination. So you, I, I'm, I have a little bit documented the, the findings of uh, this huge literature. Uh, and for instance, in these push factors, there has been a growing literature on the quality of institution at origin, acting as push factors, uh, the climatic factors, the, 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 the conflicts, and of course, the pull factors. But something that I would like to, uh, to, to, to make as an important point is that when you use actual flows and you try with these actual flows to connect that to determinants, there is something which is a little bit an issue. In fact, if you uh, try to observe the, the flows of people moving from a particular origin to a particular destination, and you try to connect that with uh, two types uh, with factors, you can classify these factors in two broad categories. And it's what we call, on the one hand, the self-selection factors, and on the other hand, the old selection factors. The self-selection factors are the factors that are going to motivate you to, to move, to motivate you not only to leave your country, but to choose a specific destination. So factors that are going to create incentives for people to move. But then you see that this is only one part of the story. You have other important factors that are going also to explain what you observed in reality. And these factors are what we call old selection factors. And these old selection factors are very important. So let me uh, uh, give a little bit some details about what uh, examples of the self and out selection factors. So as I said, the self-selection factors that I emphasize and that are emphasized in that literature are the wage differential, the distance, the networks. And this is something which is very important to try to identify. But on top of that, you have the out selection factors, the factors that are going to constrain your choice in terms of destination. And of course, among these uh, out selection factors, we have at least, at least two types of factors that are very important. One type of factor which is specific to the origin of these international immigrants, which are, for instance, the liqui liquidity constraints. Liquidity constraints means that people have not the financial means to afford leaving the country. They need money to be able to move. They, uh, need, uh, to, they need to have an access to uh, some infrastructure to be able to leave their country. And of course, there is the elephant in the room, which is related to immigration policies. How destinations are going to allow you to come uh, to, to your country. So what, what I mean by, of course, immigration policies is all the visa restrictions that uh, especially developed countries put on people wishing to migrate. The issue is that this is very, very difficult to observe. This is very difficult to observe uh, or at least to measure. So I, uh, and when it comes to uh, the, the, the two uh, examples of these selection factors, immigration policies, and li liquidity constraints, what we can say is that, first, for liquidity constraints, it's very, very difficult to uh, capture that because it's not observed. It's very difficult to know for each type of migrant what are the level of these uh, factors that are going to prevent them to move from uh, their country. And when it comes to immigration policies, and I'm going to do the connection with um, what uh, Conchita referred to about this Impala project, I can tell you that it's very, very difficult to measure immigration policies. Why? Because it is very, very complex. Uh, we have tried that with the uh, Impala project. It's still ongoing. 
And I can tell you that it's going to take still many years to have something which is precise enough that we can try to estimate the impact of these immigration policies. So the current situation is that these old selection factors are not very uh, well captured in the literature. And basically, for in most of the, the papers belonging to this literature, they are more or less ignored. The issue is that these old selection factors have a huge impact. So let me give you an example. If I want to go to the US because the US is attractive in terms of economic opportunities, because I have friends over there, I like uh, the amenities over there. OK, so my self-selection factors are going to, uh, um, to invite me to choose the US as my preferred destination. But if I have a visa restriction that prevents me to go to the US, the actual outcome might be that I'm not going to end up maybe in the US, but I'm going to end up in Australia or in a similar country, which is going to allow me to, uh, to migrate. So if we ignore these factors, we can, have, we can do mistakes in terms of uh, explaining what are the motivations cho to choose this preferred uh, destination. In other terms, I'm going to say that I'm going to observe that people go to Canada and I'm going to try to ascribe basically the incentives to go to Canada to things that are specific to Canada while my motivation was about the US. So the, the thing is, the, 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 uh, the, what I would like to emphasize is that uh, I would like to identify the self-selection factors, but without, uh, without being uh, confounded by the role of old selection factors that, that are very difficult to observe. Okay? Uh, this, the identification of these self-selection factors is very important. And self-selection factors they are the factors that motivate you to, to migrate. A first motivation to pay very uh, much attention to these self-selection factors is the quote of George Borjas, who is maybe the, the, the most well-known scholar in, uh, in our field. And uh, 20 years ago, or more than 20 years ago, Borjas said that a good understanding of the economic impact of immigration requires an understanding of the factors that motivate persons in the source countries. Of course, uh, it is used in plain words, but what he had in mind is the, the, the self-selection factors. Okay? So, for instance, what he had in mind is that if you want to understand the impact of these immigrants, for instance, on the labor market at destination, it's very important to know why they chose to come to your country. What are the motivations of these persons? And uh, the motivations might differ across different types of immigrants, but to know that, for instance, they had an economic motivation is going to be key to be able to understand uh, the impact of uh, these immigrants in terms of uh, wages, in terms of employment, and so on and so on. So, what, so we, are, we face an issue here. We would like to... Uh, to look at the role of these self-selection factors, but if we use actual migration flows, so data on actual mobility, this is very difficult to uh, estimate or to identify the role. But here, today, I would like to emphasize that we have hopefully one solution, which is to use new type of data, which uh, are data on migration aspirations, migration intentions. So, the migration intentions that I'm going to, uh, to emphasize are based on a huge survey which has been conducted for more than 10 years now by a private firm which is called Gallup and, and the survey is called the Gallup World Survey which has been conducted in uh, all origin countries of the world. And I'm going to give you some details about this Gallup data and then I'm going to show you what we can do with uh, this Gallup data. A first motivation to use the Gallup data has been, for instance, used by the World Bank is to estimate the potential migrants. So very often you listen to the press and uh, you've got the feeling that the whole world would like to move or basically that, for instance, Europe is under a big pressure in terms of uh, immigration because there are a lot of people 
who would like to come to Europe. This might be true, but of course, we need to look at the data to have an estimation of how many people would like to, to move to Europe. So an estimation of these potential migrants can be used uh, using this data. Uh, and maybe I'm ca I can give you an idea of uh, this estimation, which have been done by the World Bank, not by me. Eh? So if you have uh, questions, maybe you can, you can contact the World Bank. But basically, they would like to come up with a raw estimate of the number of people who would like to migrate to each destination. So for instance, they have documented that uh, there are a lot of people that would like to move to the US uh, if uh, basically they had the possibility to move to the US. So it has been first used as a raw estimation of the migration pressures as the number of these potential uh, uh, migrants. Something that I'm going to use more, it's more than the raw numbers, it's the structure of the desired migration. So where would you like to move? Where would, you, uh, would the intended migrants uh, would like to move, what are the favorite destination? And I'm going to show you that it is a source of very useful information, okay? So, what are the, the, the details about this Gallup? The, the Gallup data uh, are very rich. So, the, these are uh, surveys that have been conducted in more than 160 countries in the world, so it's very comprehensive. It, in, it includes 99% of the world population which is uh, age 15 and more. Uh, for uh, at least in each country, you have at least 1,000 respondents. This is not totally true. I checked for Luxembourg, it is less than 1,000 in Luxembourg, but it is, uh, it is at least 500 respondents, but it's only for a few small countries that they have, de they have decreased this threshold. Uh, and for big countries like China, of course, it's much more than uh, 1,000 respondents. The surveys are done by uh, phone and face-to-face. -face, and basically, they ask two key questions. And these key questions are very important. The first question is that, ideally, if you had the opportunity, would you like to move permanently to another country? Or would you like to, uh, would you prefer to continue living in, 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 in your country? And then, if you want to leave, to which country would you like to move? Okay, so, and I'm going to show you that we can exploit this rich source of information to shed some light on this question of the self-selection factors. Okay, so, uh, first of all, let me give you the structure of uh, this Gallup data. You see that from this figure, the blue cells means that are the cells that are filled up by Gallup and the red cells are the cells that are uh, not uh, available. And a cell means an origin country, so the, the country in which this survey is conducted, and the year. And you see that, of course, uh, over time, you have more and more blue cells, meaning that almost in the most recent uh, waves of this Gallup data, all origin countries of the world are covered, which is, which is amazing. And we are talking about 160 countries, including countries that are very, very small, okay? And especially small developing countries, it's, it's very important to uh, have a picture of the uh, aspiration of uh, these people uh, to move out of the country and where they, they would like to go. Now, uh, what, what we observed uh, what we observe in this Gallup data is that the preferred migration destination, so the destination that people uh, point out as their preferred destination, I would like to do to the US, I would like to go to Australia, it's even more concentrated than the actual destination that I showed you before. So it's already a good indication that actually people would like to go to some destinations, but they can't. And maybe they can't because of these migration policies. So the fact that these preferred migration destinations are more concentrated than the observed bilateral flows might reflect the impact of restrictive immigration policies. Okay? So this is one thing. The, uh, the second thing that uh, I'm looking at time. So uh, I have some data for Luxembourg, but maybe I'm going to skip that because uh, I would like to spend more time on uh, something which is maybe more global. 
Something that I would like to uh, emphasize is to look first as, uh, at the desired immigration rate. So the proportion of people who would like to, to leave their country. And if you look first at uh, the data, you see that, and here the data uh, concerns the whole population. So we do not make any distinction between the types of respondents. You see that the desired immigration rate in the world, so we do the average of everything, so origin countries and so on and so on, it oscillates between, uh, let's say, 19 and 23%. So if you think about that, it's not that much. So we just ask, on average, we, the people who are asked would you like to leave the country? Uh, basically, about, uh, about one person out of five say yes. Okay? And then, of course, on top of that, you are going to have different factors that are going to affect the, the final outcome. If you take, if you take uh, uh, some people at working age, this immigration rate decreases to uh, 12%. So, of course, uh, this is an average, and there is also a huge heterogeneity across countries, for instance, across origin countries. So, of course, the picture is very heterogeneous. Here, I'm giving you the average intended immigration rate, the average over the, all the waves, and you see that for some countries, you have more than 60%. So, this is the the highest level, but for, for a couple of countries, you have less than 2 or 3% of people who would like to leave their country. So there is a huge uh, heterogeneity once again in these uh, immigration, uh, this, this desired immigration rates. And if you take the maximum immigration rate that people have uh, uh, given across all the waves, uh, this heterogeneity is even, is even higher. Now, something which is very interesting is that I look at some countries, and this is a question that I'm going to ask. Does it mean something, these desired immigration rate? I, I'm subject to a survey, and I say, okay, uh, Michel, would you like to leave your country? Oh, yeah, why not? Okay, so maybe we can think that it is a little bit of some cheap talk, and I'm going to get back to this question. But before tackling specifically this question, I have looked at a, a couple of uh, countries and, uh, in which uh, basically I, I saw some movement over time of this uh, average immigration rate. So let me, for instance, look at a country that uh, maybe you, you have heard about this country with a very messy situation, uh, which is Venezuela, but there are other countries. And you see that uh, in the recent period of time, you have a big increase in the proportion of people who would like to leave their country. Of course, this is for countries that are uh, subject to rising immigration rates. You have also good cases in the, in the sense that you have also countries in which you have a big decrease in the proportion of people who would like to leave their country. And uh, uh, a very interesting example uh, here, the orange line, this is, for instance, Zimbabwe. And basically, the sharp decrease of the desired immigration rate in Zimbabwe correspond to a very sharp improvement of the living conditions over there. So you, it's, there is no doubt that these desired immigration rate can be used as a synthetic indicator of the welfare perception of the native people in their own origin countries. Okay? So, and I think that this is an interesting source of, uh, of information. Now, something that uh, I would like to uh, emphasize is what does it really mean, these uh, migration aspirations? So you might have, and I think that a lot of you have concern that these intended migration data are not really realable. Basically, the, people are asked whether they would like to leave their country and to pick up a favorite destination, but basically they don't have to do any action with respect to that. So a related question that I'm going to uh, tackle is, to what extent are intended migrants rational? When they pick up a favorite destination, are they rational? 
or are they partly rational? So to what extent, for instance, do they take into account, at least in an informal way, some information that are available at the destination? And also, are all intended migrants similar in their expectations or either also heterogeneity? And in, in this Gallup data, we can make use of the breakdown of the survey by char characteristics of people. So basically, we have information about the age of these respondents. We have information about the family structure, which is very useful for uh, family migration, about, and this is of course very key, about their education and about their income. So we can make use of uh, these uh, this type of information to shed some light. So, the big, the first question that uh, the first question that uh, I would like to tackle is it cheap talk? So, does it mean something? And my answer is no. It is not cheap talk, and there is uh, some dimension of rationality in uh, the data. Not so much to predict absolute numbers, but to predict the structure of actual migration, and. Uh, I want to uh, document uh, two uh, important points. The first example is uh, that this data has been used to try to capture the role of networks, the role of diasporas. We know that when you have people of your origin country in a specific destination, this is very useful. And so, for instance, uh, two colleagues, uh, uh, Simone Bertoli and Ilse Reusen, have used the Gallup data to look at the role of networks in picking up a particular destination, a particular uh, desired uh, destination. And they show that, for instance, when you know an individual of your country living in a specific, um, uh, in a specific uh, uh, destination, it raises the probability that you are going to uh, pick up that particular destination by a factor between six and eight, which is huge. And which shows that people also integrate in their uh, wishes uh, the, the role of networks. Another point which is very important is that these authors have shown that if we take some uh, analysis, I would say econometric analysis of using my uh, actual migration flows, we and if we put all the factors that tend to explain these actual migration flows, and on top of that, you put these intentions, these intentions have predicted power. So it means that when you take into account intentions on top of all the factors, you improve your forecast about what you observed in reality. So you see that this is a very useful and rational source of information. So the... The, 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 the thing that we have done quite recently and in uh, the, the same perspective is that we have asked a question, to what extent potential migrants use some information at destination? So for instance, if I am subject to uh, this question and if I am asked, would you like to pick up one particular destination and I'm going to say yes, for instance, I would like to go to the US, is it based also uh, on the fact that I have try to get some information which is specific to the US. And we have looked at a specific type of information at destination, which is about integration policies. So the policies that destination countries conduct to favor the integration of migrants. And you should understand integration in different dimensions. It's not only about the labor market. It's also uh, uh, it's also political rights, so for instance, acquisition of nationality, uh, political rights, so the, the, the right to vote, uh, the, uh, how it is easy to have access to permanent residence, uh, the scope of family reunification, so if you are allowed to go to that country, are you going to be able to bring your family or your relatives uh, quite easily? education policies of the children. So we have looked at whether these integration policies are going to affect the choice of these destinations in the Gallup data. Okay, so basically we ask three specific questions. 
Do potential migrants take into account differences in integration policies in choosing your preferred destinations? If it is the case, which policies tend to uh, raise attractiveness of the destination? And then are the differences across types of potential migrants? So for instance, do skilled migrants pay more attention to education policies compared to unskilled migrants? This is a question that we ask. I'm going to, ver to be very quick, and I'm not going to uh, uh, basically uh, comment too much my uh, econometric estimations. It's not the purpose here. But what I would like to uh, show you is that we have, look we have looked at six particular policies, the access to the labor market, for, and these are policies that are specific uh, to immigrants. Not, this is not the overall access to the labor market for natives. No, it's specific to immigrants which is very important. So the, these policies, uh, the, the data set that we have used for, uh, to capture these policies are the MIPEX. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that. And you see that we have looked at labor market, family reunification, permanent residence, nationality, political participation, and access to education. And the, it's very, in a very robust way, we show that the two integration policies that tend to affect the choice of this country as a destination are to what, excess, to what extent is it uh, easy for the immigrants to have access to the labor market. And this is by far the most important factor. And the other factor is access to nationality. Okay? And we do not find much action for the other policies. Okay, and this is quite robust. And you might say, yes, but uh, these calculations, maybe they might be subject to specific bias, which is possible. And we have done something which is very interesting and very intuitive. So you do not need to know econometrics to understand what we have done. We have done what we called in econometrics a placebo. A placebo means I'm going to put me in a context in which these policies should not have an impact. In particular, I have looked at the migration only within the Schengen area, in which the access to the labor market for these immigrants is very, very easy. So the specific labor market policies that are in place in these countries should not play any role. Okay? But still, access to nationality should play a role. It is it is completely independent of whether you are going to come from a Schengen area or not. Just to give you an example, I'm from Belgium. For me, it's very easy to have access to the, uh, to the labor market in Luxembourg. But it's not because I am Belgium that is the, the, the access to nationality will be much easier for me. And when we do this placebo, this impact of labor market policies disappears and the nationality doesn't disappear. So I think that it is some kind of uh, test to see if there is something that, uh, that is behind this type of estimations. OK, uh, so the, the third question that, uh, that we ask is, are there differences across types of potential migrants? Of course, yes, but not so much. So, the only differences that, uh, that we have seen in this study is that high-skilled migrants tend to value more wage differentials, so they pay more to the issue of wage differentials. They pay more attention to the labor market, and they pay more attention to acquisition of nationality. And the high-skilled migrants also value, in a modest way, the access to permanent residence. And this is in comparison with the uh, uh, unskilled migrants. Something which was a little bit surprising is that the policies, uh, the education policies that target the children of immigrants do not play such a big role. But it plays some role for only one category of respondents. These are the young respondents. So I think that it makes sense to have that type of result. But, on, but what does it mean uh, uh, overall? It's that people are rational but not rational at the point that they are going to integrate all possible integration policies, okay? So I think that overall, this is uh, some evidence that uh, intended migrants are partially rational. At least they process, uh, they process uh, 
uh, quite well the existing information. So now I would like to finish my talk, if I may, by, uh, okay, I have emphasized the usefulness of this Gallup data. I think that it's uh, some kind of good publicity for the Gallup data, and I'm not con uh, I have no connection with uh, Gallup, by the way, huh? so uh, I'm not a sus suspect from that point of view. But I would like also to uh, take a stance and to maybe to emphasize a couple of limitations of uh, these uh, uh, Gallup data. First of all, you might wonder whether the question on the permanent moves uh, is not going to be too restrictive. So if you remember the question is that the question is, if you had the possibility, would you like to move permanently to another country? So you might say yes, but question about temporary moves are very important as well. This is true, and, uh, but there is one caveat to the use of temporary uh, migration is that uh, in general, the literature tend to find that migrants tend to underestimate the time that they are going to uh, spend abroad. And I'm sure that in this room, there are many people like that. So maybe some people said, okay, I'm going to work in Luxembourg for a few years, and then I'm going to be back in my country. And basically 15 years after, you are still in Luxembourg. So it's very well known in, in the literature. So this question about permanent moves uh, and, and temporary moves, the, the distinction is not, is not that clear. So the... Uh, the, the, the second thing that, uh, that I would like to emphasize is that some people have been, have been critical about the use of this data. So, for instance, an author that I know quite well, Sylvia Migali, and she said, okay, but to what extent uh, we should not put an additional layer on these uh, migration intentions? So, for instance, we can uh, ask only uh, the people that have done real plans. And there is a small question about that in Gallup, but for a very restricted sample. So there is a question about, in the last 12 months, have you, been, uh, have you uh, prepared some uh, plans to move out of your country? The, the, the limitation of this question is that the, the type of plans is very vague, so it can be any type of plans. And also, the period of uh, 12 months is quite restrictive. But, so it is unclear whether uh, the, the, the question about the plants adds uh, an important source of information, but I think that it is uh, uh, some scope for the future to make use of this particular question to refine a little bit our uh, estimate of the desired immigration rate. So then I want to point out uh, also a very uh, important limitation, and this gives me the opportunity to talk about uh, one future project that I'm going to uh, conduct with uh, two colleagues of university, Arnaud Dupuis and Mylinda Yoxe. Mylinda is over there. Huh? She's raising her hand. So uh, a big drawback of the Gallup is that when you have this question, you, have, you uh, just say, I would like to leave my country, and you have just to give one preferred destination. And we think that it is very restrictive. Why is it very restrictive? Because of these out selection factors. So information about the other preferred destination might be very useful. So rather than to ask people just one preferred destination, you should ask them a, a ranking of preferred destination. Why is it important? Because it might be the case that you really want to leave your country and you are prepared to end up in different destinations, but you are going to end up in the destination which is maybe the third of the fourth destination because of these restrictive immigration policies. So to give you an example, I might end up uh, in Luxembourg because initially I wanted to go to the US, to Canada, and to the UK, but I, I was not able to get the visa. Okay? And so with a list of uh, destinations, you can study the role of deflection of these immigration policies. To what extent immigration policies force some immigrants to end up in destinations that were not the first destination uh, initially, okay? So this is a very uh, interesting uh, thing. And so uh, to do that, we are going to, uh, to conduct a, a field experiment in the origin country of Mylinda, uh, which is Albania. And by the way, maybe if I may, before uh, Albania, Albania should be there. So you see that Albania is one 
of the most, it is one of the countries uh, which are subject to the highest desired immigration rate in the, in the world. And by far in Europe, this is the country which, uh, in which the intended immigrants uh, are uh, the, the most numerous. So it's not totally random that uh, we have picked up uh, uh, Albania, because when you talk about Albania, you, you really talk about uh, desired immigration. So uh, this, is, this allows me to connect with, with that. So I think that it's more or less time to, to conclude looking at the boss. <laughs> uh, so let me wrap up very quickly uh, my talk. So uh, analysis based on actual flows is very useful. It has been used uh, extensively in the literature, but it is confounded by the impact of these old selection factors, these constraints on uh, migration. So the, one of the solutions to have a better estimation on the self-selection factors is to use migration intentions. And uh, uh, in that respect, uh, I have documented a little bit the, 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 the use of a new uh, survey, which is the Gallup World uh, Poll Survey. Uh, and these uh, surveys allows you to improve the forecast on future migration pressures. Uh, they uh, also reveal the attractiveness of foreign destinations. And they, are also, they also reveal uh, the perception of well-being in the origin country. And what I have tried to uh, show is that intended migrants are partially rational. So when they pick up, uh, when they stay that they would like to leave their country and when they stay that they, stay that they would like to go to one particular destination, this is not totally random. They use uh, available information and, for instance, they internalize the way integration policies are uh, conducted in the destination. So it is uh, some uh, evidence that these uh, intended my immigrants and, uh, are partially Russian. So I'm going to uh, finish here. And thank you very much for the attention. Thank you.